let us pray for these children. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Which we want to totally submit these children to your able hands. Thank you. Your servants have, have laid hands on them and praying breakthrough upon them, upon their lives, God. We want to pray for their perfect health. We want to pray for their parents. Bless the work of their hands and continue being together with them, God. Let them experience your greatness and your goodness. And let your Holy Spirit be upon them, God. We want to pray for them as they grow. Let them grow loved by men and also loved by you, God. We pray that they may grow with favor with you, God, and with favor with men. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray and believe. Amen. God bless you, and God bless you. Amen? Amen. Let us appreciate them once more. It is always beautiful to bring our children to the house of the Lord as you connect them to their blessings and as you also pray for God's guidance upon their lives as they grow up. Now church, uh, turn with me in the book of Luke. Turn with me in the book of Luke. Chapter 3. Book of Luke, chapter 3. We'll be reading from verse 7 all through to verse 17. The Lord will guide us as we go through. Let us honor God by being on our feet as we read His word. And appreciate him for blessing us with such a word this morning. This is what God's word says. I hope we are all there. The gospel according to Luke chapter number 3 verse 7 to 17. John said to the crowds coming out, of, out to be baptized by him. You brood of vipers who want you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should Share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some of the soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. May the Lord bless his word. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that you align our will, tune our spirit to be in tune with your spirit. And Lord, may you open our hearts that we may receive your word as you have blessed it, my heart, for us today. We thank you and exalt you now as we sit. May you help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We can have our seats. We can have our seats. This morning, I would like to speak on a subject, a call to repentance. A call to repentance. And it is also in line with our annual theme, bearing fruit. And uh, the portion of scripture that you have just read, we encounter one of the greatest preachers um, of, of that of his time, and that is uh, John the Baptist, who is making a public declaration of God's word and calling people to prepare the way for the Lord as 
is of paramount importance to them as they look forward to the coming of the Messiah. The portion that you have just read, it's a slightly different from the portion in Matthew chapter 3, where we note Matthew is a bit specific about the crowds. He's speaking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we see in the gospel according to Luke, he is a bit general about the crowd, but he also mentions the tax collectors and the who? And the, the soldiers, thank you. <laughs> and the soldiers. And so that tells you the category, or rather the kind of the kind of crowd that are attracted to John. Remember, John was preaching in the wilderness, and his voice was heard crying. And the summary of what he was crying has also been quoted in Isaiah, verse 4 of the same chapter. A voice of one calling the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. And as we Reflect through, would like us to ask ourselves a question. Where will we spend eternity? And what are the kind of fruit that you are bearing, even as we come each and every other day to join together in a worship service? And it is my prayer that the Lord will help us to know that to, to know and to rectify our ways to rectify how we relate with God and how we relate with one another. Now we ask ourselves, what is repentance? Just before I move to the portion of scripture, we ask ourselves, what is repentance and why the call to repentance? Now why the call to repentance? You discover that Mostly people, when they affiliate themselves with a body of Christ or a religious family or community, there is a tendency that they tend to forget how to honor God and how to live for God in accordance to how God has guided us in his word, how God has revealed to us in his word. And then you also come to discover, even in the body of Christ, we have among us ourselves who are wounded because of others who might not be producing the fruit. As, as John would put it, Luke would put it, producing the fruit in keeping with repentance. Unity. And love is a precious thing of all to be embraced, of all to, to bring us together, to steer us, to bring people closer to God, to point people to the one who brings about the difference. But friends, you discover repentance has become just another thing that one will choose. At times to repent or be remorseful, or at times choose not to be remorseful. But is it how God intends it for us? So it's always good to be reminded that we should constantly live a life of repentance, maintain our ways with the Lord, maintain our ways with fellow brethren. If at all we are going to be fruitful in our relationships, in how we work together, and how we fellowship together as a body of Christ. Praise be to God. Now, in the portion of scripture, we observe three things that John 
is bringing to our attention. And one of the thing among the three, one is the rebuke. When you look into verse 7 all through to verse 9, you discover or rather you observe a sharp rebuke. A, sh a rebuke that is related to the hypocritical people of the day. And actually it goes ahead to give a stern warning and call them brood of vipers. You also notice again from verse 10 all through to verse 14, another observation of the response of the crowds when they received this word. And that is from verse 10 to 14 as mentioned. And then lastly, from verse 15 to 17, you discover there is a redemption promise that John brings on board, or rather speaks to them after they ask him whether he is the Messiah. And then John declines that he is not the Messiah and points to one who will come, is it after or, who will come behind him who is more powerful than himself, in whose thongs and sandals is not worthy to untie. And then he speaks about how his baptism will be different from the baptism that they, they knew or John was doing or contacting. And so, just giving us an overview of what is happening in that passage will help us as we go through the passage in as few minutes as possible and we'll derive three things which we see in those observations of this, of the, the rebuke and the response and the redemption promise. And so just to give us a definition of repentance is that repentance is being sorry enough to quit your sin. You will never know the forgiving mercy of God while you are still wedded to your sins. Repentance is the soul's divorce from sin, but it, is, it will always be joined to faith. Repentance that is not joined to faith is a legalistic repentance. Professed faith that is not joined to repentance is a spurious faith. For true faith is faith in Christ. To save me, not in, but from my sin, repentance and faith are inseparable. And as Luke 13, 3 will still say, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now that is a good definition that I got from one author by name Albert Martin. But a sum up of the same is to say that repentance is not trying to do more to please God, but letting go of your independence and trusting God to order and provide. And so, three things, three things, or three S's about repentance, three S's about genuine repentance is derived from the observation of this portion of scripture. Now, one we note that genuine repentance saves you from ruin. Genuine repentance saves you. The first S is saves you from ruin. John said, you brood of vipers. Brood is another word for children. Vipers is a name for a snake. And when you relate it now with God's kingdom, he's referring to you, children of Satan. Remember the crowd. That is, we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and we have the tax collectors and the soldiers among other people who are in the crowds. And you discover in every crowd, these kind of people will be there. Now, if you 
know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees would always love to defend the law and defend that which they do not know. They would, they would prosecute or rather they would oppose the truth of the gospel. They would even go to an extent of killing those who, or rather jailing those who preach the gospel of the day. You think about the tax collectors and their way of behavior. You think about the soldiers and their way of behavior. Then you discover that in a crowd, you will have all sorts of characters of people represented. Now, genuine re repentance saves you from ruin. Verse 8, the Bible reminds us that produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And that tells us that our genuineness, our genuine repentance in the presence of God should be evident in our character. How we, we conduct ourselves. A changed heart is seen by a changed lifestyle, a changed action, a changed mode of conduct as an individual and also in the public domain. And so for the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew the law, but they did the opposite of what the law taught. And so they, could, they did not stand for what the law teaches. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were biased in applying the law. They would roll it to the people that they were leading, but they would live a different life from what they were also steering people to do. And so, when John wilderness, he sees is a crowd coming, he notices these are the Pharisees and the Sadducees among others. And then he rips them off by rebuking them sharply that you need to repent. You need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Yes, if you are coming to be baptized and yet you have not repented your sins, you are not living right, then he's telling them, you are hypocrites. He's telling them you are hypocrites. A simple definition of hypocrisy is being, you know, being opposite of the real you. Being opposite of the real you. You know, being someone who you are not. So this is the rebuke that these people received. Notice in verse 8b what he says. And do not begin to say to yourselves. John knew that these people defend themselves by bringing up um, this clause that we have Abraham as our, as our father. So they brag because they were Jews. They brag that uh, automatically even the kingdom of God is ours. We, we know the truth. We live by the truth. But deep down in their hearts, they knew that they were, they compromised in some areas. And so then John tells them, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. He's speaking now, addressing to the, the same congregation. Telling them that for, for us or for you to produce a fruit in keeping with repentance, hmm? it, it emanates from a relationship with Christ. It emanates from a relationship. It springs from a relationship with Christ. And so that's why he's saying, for I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for, for Abraham. 
So in other words, he's also telling them that uh, I doubt whether you are children of Abraham. Because Abraham was known to be a man of faith. A man who obeyed God. But for them, it was opposite of what Abraham was commended for. I also told of the consequences of not repenting. And the result is judgment. He says the axe is ready. It's already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce fruit, good, produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And so he's speaking about the urgency of them repenting of their sins. Because they know not what may come after. And this helps us as a, as, as a family of God to reflect upon our lives and ask ourselves, what happens? I'm not in this world. What happens if Jesus shows up today? How will, how will my life be? How am I going to spend my life? Where will I head to? So genuine repentance saves you from ruin. So if we, we choose not to repent, there are repercussions of not repenting. And some of them, and some of them be obvious. Let me just give an example. If you wrong a friend and you choose not to say sorry to them, what happens? The relationship is ruined. The same case. When we are not right with, with the Lord, then we are ruining our relationship. When we talk about bearing fruit, we cannot bear fruit unless we abide in Christ. And so it's only our sins that will keep us from bearing fruit. It's only our sin that will make us not to be fruitful. For the crowd that John saw, he noted that they are, can, they are not producing the fruit of repentance. Because once you genuinely repent, when you are, when you are right with God, when, when, when you, are, you have a clear conscience with the Lord, then you mend your relationship with God, then you are able to be fruitful. Now the second thing, genuine repentance Starves your fleshly appetites. Genuine repentance starves your natural appetites with examples given. Now we have we have the tax collectors who took more than they were supposed to take. They were greedy for more. They were building themselves a life. And actually the tax collectors were Jews who were appointed and were working for the Roman government to go to the Jews to, to get, rather to, to take, <laughs> is it to take or to get, to get tax from them, to collect money from them. And what happened is that they used to, to take more than required. And the, 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 anything that was above what they took, they kept it to themselves. And so they were greedy for more. They were greedy for money. The same with the, the, the soldiers who were sent to oversee the crowd, to, to, to protect the, the, the tax collectors, to execute what the tax collectors did. They were also forceful. They were taking property that did not belong to them by force. And so John here is warning them, is rebuking them, telling them, telling them that that is not the way you're supposed to live. So the, the word that they had from John convicted them and that's why they are asking this question. What should we do then? The tax collectors ask the same thing. Teacher, what should we do? 
the soldiers in verse 14 asks again what should we do and then he he replies he gives them a response and one is that when we starve our natural appetites our greediness our selfishness then we we become hospitable we become caring we become loving an example that john gives in verse 11 he says a man with two tunics should share with him who has not none and the one who has food should do the same in a summary is that when you when you are right with god when you repent in the presence of god when you are when when you are right in your relationship with god then you experience the love of god in your life and you extend the same love to your neighbors or the people who are around you this is what he's saying if you have to you should share if it's if, if you it's about food, again sharing with others and so when when we we are we are right with god then some of these natural appetites keep on dying keep on dying when you find yourself you're in the wrong it should be easy to say i'm sorry forgive me and mend your ways with the offender or, the, or with the offended so we we become hospitable we become generous in sharing what we have verse 12 to 13 we become faithful the tax collectors and the soldiers they be, you become faithful in doing exactly what you're supposed to do and you do it fo focusing on the one who gave you the job or who helped you to do the job again we become contented when you look at the soldiers they were not contented he tells them be contented with your with your pay not wanting more I was to share an, uh, an example but for the, for the interest of time let me not mention it lastly genuine repentance steers or steers you to the redemption promise so not only does gen genuine repentance save you from ruin and starve your natural appetites but also steers you to the redemption promise verse 15 the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if john might possibly be the christ john answered them i baptize you with water but one more powerful will come and he continues and talks about the winnowing fork in his hands to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wood just in a summary of those verses is that john states that he's not the messiah so he's showing his dependence on the one who is able to do it john baptizes with water water which cannot forgive sin water which cannot make one righteous water which cannot heal water which cannot give them a right standing with god but he mentions of one jesus baptism he speaks about the holy spirit who is the third person of the trinity and with fire so he talks about fire he's speaking about that person who doesn't repent genuinely who is just religious but lost he says he will be thrown into the fire the lake of fire he's speaking about judgment that will come upon those who will not repent genuinely he also speaks about the coming separation and that is in verse 17 speaking about the winnowing fork the winnowing fork was used by farmers to separate the grain and the chaff so it's that big fork that they would throw the wheat in the air and then the wind blows and separates the grain from the chaff and so what is what is he saying that there is a separation that will come in the in the future when christ comes there will be a separation will be separated the the 
the, the righteous and the unrighteous, those who repented and those who did not repent. But even as you reflect through, let me pose a question to you. Where is your sin punished? Where is your sin punished? Where is your sin punished? Every sin will be punished. And there are only two places. One, it will be punished in hell. Or the second, you can choose your sin to be punished in Christ at the cross. And so it, it's upon us. Where we choose our sin to be punished. If you never repented your sins, an opportunity is still available that you make a right your ways with the Lord. Come to Jesus and he will redeem you and make you live a right and be fruitful. Let's pray. Thank you Lord, for your word this morning. Pray that you continue to reveal your word to us, teachers, and help us to be right.